Welcome back to Morning Joe. Joe recently sat down with best-selling author Malcolm Gladwell to talk about his book titled The Bomber Mafia, A Dream, A Temptation, and The Longest Night of the Second World War. It's now out in paperback, and it is the remarkable story of a group of strategists who forever changed military history and the world. I started an audio company with my friend Jacob Weisberg, and um, we sort of specialize in creating these new kinds of audiobooks that are immersive that have lots of interview tape that are almost like audio documentaries. And, but the story of the Bomber Mafia is such a, I don't know, it's such a fantastic story. I feel like it works in any form. So we thought, you know, a book would be just as powerful as in a different way, but just as powerful as the audiobook. Um, I, I continue to be amazed. There was an un, there was a great untold story from the second world war, but uh, I think there was, and that's, that's the story of the Bomber yeah. Mafia. You know, I, I've thought so much uh, of the Bomber Mafia, and one of the reasons why I bought the, bought the book and also downloaded it is because, obviously, we're seeing these unguided missiles going into apartments in Kiev, going into shopping malls, and it made me reflect back on what uh, the stories that I remember. Uh, we all, of course, remember Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki, but I remember those horrid Tokyo bombing raids. I remember... Uh, reading about Dresden, I remember reading about where we would uh, firebomb uh, huge swaths of, of cities. And I always thought, well, it was the 1940s. We really didn't have any other choice. Of course, the bomber mafia actually explains how we did. Uh, could you could you go into it? Yes. Yeah, so there's a it's this, the bomber mafia is a story of this group of highly idealistic brilliant young men who were at Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama in the 1930s and became convinced that the bomber, the sort of advent of these fast, high-flying bombers, would for and the, also the advent of some of the beginnings of precision bombing, the idea that you could actually drop a bomb pretty close to your intended target. They felt those two facts would change warfare forever. Um, and they bring this incredibly idealistic um, technological fantasy to the Second World War and try and ultimately fail to kind of transform the Second World War along those lines. But, on, but now, of course, we see, you know, the, the, we, we're in the world that they imagined um, 80 years ago. Uh, so it's like they were far ahead of their time, which is part of what makes them so interesting. But the, you know, the, their struggle to bring this vision of how um, just by relying on a bomber and just by dropping bombs precisely where you wanted, um, you could transform war. They try to the struggle of how they try to make that real during first the European bombing campaigns and then the bombing campaigns over Japan is a kind of it's an amazing, heartbreaking, fascinating story. Yeah, you know, I um, I grew up, uh, loved reading Tom Wolfe's The Right Stuff. I loved the movie, loved Sam Shepard, loved, loved all of it. And and you got the idea that these cowboys, you know, when it, when it came to aviation, uh, it was all it was in the 1950s, it was in the 1960s, it was in California. But you uh, you actually find these band of brothers from central Alabama at Maxwell. Yeah. And I think what shocked me so much, not only that it was like that I passed Maxwell Air Force Base driving a hundred times, had no idea what happened there. I think what shocked me the most was how early this was. Like back when these guys were imagining the future we're gonna live in 80 years from now, people kind of looked at, at pilots and people who were flying planes, it's kind of quirky. Uh, it, it, and, and sort of out there, certainly least. the military did, right? Yeah. Well, the reason they're the reason they were in Maxwell uh, Air Force Base in, in Montgomery is that originally, you know, the Air Force was originally just a division of the Army, of course, through the through the end of the Second World War. And so here's a group of young men who are obsessed with this brand new technology, the airplane, and they're 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 chafing against the traditionalist traditionalism of the Army. The Army, people think of the airplane as a toy, a gadget, as, as, you know, marginal to the task of waging war. But this group, the Bar Mafia, think that's wrong. This is something that should transform everything we think about how to wage 
Um, so they're they're based in Virginia, and they realize we can't we can't dream and <laughs> and and push the envelope and and develop these technologies if we're under the thumb of the army. Let's try and go as far as possible from army headquarters as we can. And so where do they go? Montgomery, then is now <laughs> as far as you can get from Washington DC, right? So yeah. there's, a, the, there's a reason they chose that, which is they wanted to be in a place so far out of the way that nobody would ever bother them. And they used to always say, so here are these guys like working away in the thirties to, to kind of come up with to, 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 to um, fine-tune precision bombing. They would always say, if the, if the guys back in Washington knew what we were doing in Montgomery, they would fire us all. They really, <laughs> they really thought of themselves as, as renegades. Uh, speaking, of, speaking of renegades and speaking of someone who changed the world as we know it, who changed, uh, changed warfare as we know it, and, and created the, the, the world we live in now as far as as, as, as far as warfare goes, um, is a, a, talking about a quirky character. I just want to read people because you're such a masterful storyteller. Uh, these are some of my favorite lines in the book. Let me read it. He wore a three-piece suit, had short white hair with a little cowlick, a thriving mustache, and heavy-lidded eyes underwritten with deep lines. As if he hadn't slept in years, his nickname was Old Man Dynamite. He drank coffee by the gallon, lived on steak. Explain how this Dutch scientist changed the world. And we, and as you said, nobody remembered. No statues to him, no museums, yeah. not really any biographies written about him. So if you look back at the Second World War, what were the biggest projects the military undertook in the Second World War? Well, number one is obviously the Manhattan Project, right? We spent billions on that. Um, uh, number two was, uh, was were well, the big bombers that we developed for the first time in the Second World War. Number three was a little analog computer the size of a football, it was actually called the football, that was developed by this highly eccentric Dutch engineer named Carl Norden under conditions of great secrecy in downtown Manhattan, um, which was a device that was intended to allow the uh, bombardier to drop a bomb from 25,000 feet um, with perfect accuracy. So this was, think of this, you know, well before GPS, well before radar, well before any of that stuff. Norton creates this thing. It's a little, it's a little, like I said, an analog computer, and you would enter in 20 different things, your speed, the temperature, the, you know, your, your location, the, um, I mean, all any any variable you can imagine that might affect the flight of a bomb dropped from an airplane, and this device would tell you when you would when when you should wh what is the optimal moment to release the um, the gates and drop your 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 bombs. It, Norden was convinced this 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 thing worked, and it did work in theory, and it worked if you were practicing you know, under perfect conditions in the proving grounds in Utah when the sun is shining and there's no enemy planes flying at you. Um, what the bomber mafia discover, though, is when they take their prize bit of technological gadgetry into actual combat, it's a lot harder to use it to, to, to drop the bombs with the same kind of accuracy. So it's a, it's a beautiful story about, I mean, it's one of the many great themes in this. It's, you know... There's always in any era in history a group of dreamers who, who, who believe passionately in the potential of technology to transform the way we behave, the way we conduct our affairs. We have it now in Silicon Valley, right? People, a group right. of people who think that I can, you can come up with a, a bit of software and it'll, it'll solve the problems of the world. Well, Norton is the, that guy you just that you read, who read the passage about. He's... The, the, the Silicon Valley visionary of 1940. That's what he is. He's, he's such a familiar figure to me, you know? I feel like I, I, I see that person every day now in, um, in the news. Uh, you know, he's the Elon Musk, if you like, of the Second World War. Uh, it, it is it is a remarkable book. I, uh, and I hope uh, those who haven't had a chance to, to read it, to listen to it, 
uh, will do it. Of course, there is a tragic choice that is made that ends with the firebombing of Tokyo, uh, which, uh, of course, you 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 start uh, the the decision that was made by the military, the tragic decision that was made by the military. Joe's conversation with Malcolm Gladwell for the paperback release of Gladwell's book, The Bomber Mafia, A Dream, A Temptation, and the Longest Night of the Second World War. Gladwell's other new project is a limited-run podcast series titled Legacy of Speed about the American runners who raised their fist in protest during the 1968 Olympics. That part of Joe's conversation with Malcolm Gladwell is next when Morning Joe comes right back.